Um, so for the agenda we have today, uh, first we're going to go over the motivation and how um, and why we came up with the Building and Performance Exchange, give a little overview of the different categories, uh, the budget allocated for all of them. Um, then we're going to go over the four major selection criteria that we're going to be evaluating the applications. Um, and we're going to detail all the um, minor details within it. Um, Afterwards, we're going to go over how to apply. We're going to go over all the attachments, and we're going to demonstrate some examples to make sure that everyone knows how to fill those out. And just a reminder, we're going to have all questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, so just you can put them in the chat right now, and then we'll collect all of them and address them. Um, and if we don't get to it, we'll, we're going to be able to post those on the website, too. So Mass CSC work spans over four main areas of climate impact. First, we have climate, the climate innovation investments, where we help um, companies start from zero all the way to workforce development. Um, we have large-scale deployment of offshore wind, um, where we try to advance all the best innovative solutions for offshore wind, um, starting from our wind technology center all the way to all the different initiatives that we have in them. Um, and then we have our workforce development where we're really helping the Massachusetts uh, community to develop the skills necessary to address the clean energy economy. Um, and like I said, we have four main focus areas where we focus the large decarbonization. Um, first, we have clean transportation, net zero grid, um, and we also are within the high performance buildings, which is where this RFP lives. Um, and like I mentioned before, offshore wind is also in one of our main focus areas. So now I'll pass right. it on to Catherine. Yeah, thanks. So I'm just gonna, I have a few slides to give you a high level overview of what the exchange is, the motivation behind its creation, program goals, and what the broad vision is for its implementation. So the purpose of the exchange is to provide centralized information, case studies, and training to equip the building professional community for the decarbonization of larger existing buildings across the Commonwealth. The funding is for a period of time, a uh, period of four years, uh, for three phases, which we're calling phases A through C for uh, up to $4 million. And then the potential for fourth phase, phase D for up to 2 million. Um, and so just a little bit more background about the origin of the exchange. Um, here in Massachusetts, there are resources for electrification and decarbonization for the residential sector and for new construction, but Mass EAC identified a need for supporting professionals involved with retrofitting larger existing buildings. So those, what we're calling over 20,000 square feet. And with the introduction of building performance standards in Boston and Cambridge and more being proposed and adopted in other communities, we need a centralized resource to get the building professional community up to speed on how to design and implement projects that can meet the standards. So the exchange as it's laid out in the RFP is modeled off of existing exchanges in other cities, which some of you may be familiar with, like the New York City Building Energy Exchange, the Washington DC Building Innovation Hub, and the newly established Building Energy Exchanges in St. Louis and K Kansas City. So there's a lot of precedent for this kind of work in other cities, and it's just a matter of creating something that's relevant and applicable to what's happening here in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the RFP goals, which you can read in more detail on page six of the RFP but the goals are to centralize resources for large building energy retrofits, create best practices resources, adapt relevant resources from other exchanges to the Massachusetts market, host events and programs, reach new audiences not traditionally engaged in building performance, network with new organizations and facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning, and increase the observed building energy performance improvements and the application of retrofit techniques. 
Next slide, please. So this is um, a broad outline of what's laid out in the RFP for how this program will progress uh, over the course of those four years with the potential for the additional $2 million in funding. Phase A includes an initial needs assessment and program planning, including plans for staffing, outreach, content creation, and evaluation. Plan B is the implementation of the exchange, where we expect the vendor to increase their organizational capacity to be able to cre create, adapt, and deliver educational content. Uh, and that content could take many different forms, including case studies, white papers, FAQs, webinars, events, um, lots of different forms that you know, we're looking for you all to propose. And the initial focus in this phase is on engaging audiences and communities that are already subject to building performance standards. And then phase C, program scaling, that's where we will see the geographic focus of the exchange expand to be able to offer content that's more relevant to a statewide audience. And then finally, phase D, which is subject to the successful completion of phases A through C and the uh, availability of additional funding. So now we're gonna shift a little bit to discuss the selection criteria, which are laid out on the RFP starting on page 14. The selection criteria are broken up into four main categories, experience and qualifications, the completeness of the proposed approach, cost competitiveness and soundness of budget, and the overall quality proposal. So you can see that the different categories are weighted differently. And so that's something uh, to keep in mind as you're drafting your proposal. Next slide. So within each of the four main categories, there are more specific criteria that we'll be keeping in mind as we're reviewing and scoring the proposals. So for experience and qualifications, we'll be looking at the applicant's experience with the Massachusetts Building Professionals community, experience delivering educational content, their technical knowledge, and their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. For completeness of the proposed approach, we'll be looking at whether the outline um, details clear strategies for raising the profile and increasing the awareness of the building performance exchange, educating building professionals, revising the annual budgets and the implementation plan, and a plan for the operation of the exchange in the longer term. Cost competitiveness and soundness of budget. Um, so this has four criteria within that. Um, for cost comparison, we're looking at how the proposed budget compares to the budgets of other applicants. Outcomes versus grant amount, which is essentially how much work is being proposed within the available budget. Budget comprehensiveness, um, that is how well does the budget correspond with the narrative in the proposed approach. And then finally, uh, is the proposal for the upfront, upfront payments, base payments, and milestone payments comprehensive and well thought out? And we'll dive a bit more into that in a few slides. And then finally, the overall quality of the proposal is how well the proposal demonstrates an understanding of the core program concepts and the underlying motivations behind the program. And does it do a good job of identifying opportunities to leverage things like knowledge, existing infrastructure, or partnerships in order to create or increase the impact and reach the target audience? So now we're going to be talking a little bit about all the attachments that come within the application. Um, so attachment A is just kind of an understanding for both parties that every part of the RFP is necessary and is expected. Um, Want to make sure that all the application documents are in line um, and submitted. And just a reminder here that all of the attachments have to be compiled within one application. Um, and then for attachment B, we're really looking for concise and precise um, word responses. There's a 200 word limit, but that's more of a suggestion. We're trying to keep it for that, for that amount, like subtopic for less. Um, for 
So for example, for the project management reporting, that is 200 words. It could be less than that, uh, but that's just a suggestion. Um, and then for the overall statement of qualifications, um, that would be a thousand words. For proposed approach, that would be 14,000. Um, so overall, we're probably expecting around 15 pages of written narrative. Um, and then you can attach any work in the appendix. So resumes, any work examples, um, and those will not be included in the word count. So Bev, I'll pass it to you. Sure. Um, so the written narrative, there are two major categories that Irene just touched on. Um, the first is the statement of qualifications. And in general, we're looking for around a thousand words for this uh, section. And Catherine really went through the scoring criteria. They correspond really closely with what we're asking you to write. So hopefully that'll be really straightforward for you. Um, this, you know, the experience that an organization already has with the Massachusetts Building Professionals uh, community is really, really important. And being able to have competency already in these areas is really important. Um, we're also really interested in examples of if your organization has been able to take something sort of small and scale it up. Um, and uh, Catherine already mentioned diversity, equity, inclusion being really important. And we mean that both in programmatic ways, reaching audiences that maybe traditionally haven't been involved, but also at your organization. Next slide, please. So proposed approach, this is really the meat of the narrative and what you are going to be proposing your vision of how to use this $4 million over four years. Um, Irene mentioned that we're suggesting 200 words per topic area. Uh, we do know like, for example, the program implementation where you're creating and deliver content, that's probably gonna need more than 200 words, but um, please don't feel obligated in any of these sections to get up to 200 words. If you can say something concisely, uh, you can say words there and move it to other areas where you might need to elaborate more. Under project management and reporting, I think the RFP does a pretty good job of laying down expectations for how often we want you to check in with us at MassEC on a project management basis, uh, as well as quarterly with other state actors like Department of Energy Resources and EEA. Some um, metrics are laid out and that's really important to be tracking. And we'd like in the section here to be hearing something about how you plan to track those metrics. And also if you think that there are important other metrics that we haven't included for, that would be important to track for the success of a building energy exchange, um, building performance exchange, then this is the, sort of the section that you'd be writing something about. Um, early assessment, here we really are looking for innovative approaches to engaging st stakeholders, especially newly engaging key players that maybe have not entered yet. You can imagine a lot of affordable housing, um, of uh, school properties, of say houses of worship that so far don't really realize that they're going to be subject to building emission standards and how do we get them involved? So probably some stakeholder work with audiences like that would be important in this early assessment stage. Program plan and organizational capacity. We want to hear whether you're sort of working on a consulting basis. You already have staff in hand and you'd be uh, just utilizing those. What do you actually plan to do? If you would be building up your organizational capacity, especially with staff, what you would be seeing there. And then sort of the meat, program implementation, creating and deliver content. Obviously, until you actually do a lot of uh, this early assessment and plan, you're not going to know everything in detail. But based on what you see at the other hubs and what you know of the industry and of uh, the challenges that building owners are already having, thinking ahead to how they're going to meet building performance or building emission standards, um, I think everyone who's sort of involved in this has ideas about what's missing so far. So this is sort of where you can lay out what you think would be important. I mentioned program scaling and so did Catherine. You know, initially we really think that the most engaged audiences are going to be audiences that are subject to building emission standards in Cambridge and Boston. But there are a lot of other communities thinking about doing this and I think it's in about a year and a half 
larger buildings statewide are going to have to be reporting their emissions and maybe like building curious about decarbonization. And so there'll be a, an increasing focus on both geographically and maybe different categories of expansion. In case there's something that you think is super important to this kind of topic, but we haven't included in the RFP, we have left a section open for additional tasks that you might propose that don't fit into the, any of these other areas. And then finally, um, there is a chance that this $2 million of federal funding would be secured and would be added. So we're interested if another 2 million was added, what are your thoughts about whether you'd increase the amount per year of work done, add additional years, sort of what you're thinking is in general. Next slide. In the narrative section, there's also this key performance metric. So this corresponds very much with the metrics that we have laid out. Um, we, we have this listed out by year. So for example, you may start sort of small, but then you're gonna get a lot of new audience members who haven't engaged in this community. So we, we want you to sort of project what uh, metrics you think you could hit. If there are different target audiences that you're particularly interested in, being able to break those out is also important. And I mentioned, um, we don't just wanna track the total number of participants. We're also interested in being able to track who's new to this kind of topic. So proposing a way that you can track new program participants who haven't been engaged, who aren't the early adopters, who are already like architects and energy consultants who have been taking classes and trying decarbonization planning, but like bringing in new people is really important. Things like the number of in-person and virtual events and webinars, views and downloads of online resources that might be there, and then this percentage of participants from priority equity audiences. So you may define that different ways. We we're curious how you might define that, but um, one, some things that we mentioned in the RFP for equity purposes is that the content should be for building professionals that service affordable housing and public housing should be at least as much as other building types. And that also that owners with only one or two buildings and have, would have lower capacities and wouldn't necessarily have consultants or architects that they regularly use to help them with these kinds of things. So religious worship, schools, public assembly, nonprofit owners, all those might be things that you might want to track a little bit separately. Next slide. Budget sees an Excel spreadsheet that is meant to help you I, lay out the budget uh, that you see. I want to point out that there's two tabs. And keep in mind that this, this is not necessarily a binding legal agreement, what you propose here in the budget. Uh, we will be negotiating very specifically something in contracting, but we wanna hear your ideas for how this might work. Doing something over four years is a little challenging when you don't exactly have your whole plan laid out at the beginning. And those of you who have worked with Mass CEC in the past probably know that in general, we tend to contract by milestones and deliverables. Uh, for a four year, multi-year contracts, um, there's definitely the ability to do something that I'll describe in a moment, but that's either more a sort of a hybrid approach, that it, a hybrid milestone approach, or a uh, reimbursement services uh, kinds of agreement. So I want to point out in the spreadsheet, there are two tabs. So there's one that looks like the left chart and one that looks like the right chart. Um, the one on the left is somewhat of a summary by task of the budget and the timeline that you expect for those. The one on the right is where you're gonna get a lot more detailed about what you're proposing in the different phases. Uh, we do allow some proposal for upfront payment to get started, and especially if you're going to be hiring staff, um, as well as some base payments in coordination with milestone payments. Next slide. And so this is just a complete for example to show you this sort of hybrid approach that is possible if you're interested uh, in doing this kind of thing. In phase A, which is the program management task, you might have staffing related to checking in with Mass CEC, budgeting, uh, tracking performance metrics, uh, annual program summaries, 
And so there might be staffing towards a certain number of FTE that would be uh, covered. And instead of it just being like a milestone based thing, there would be sort of like a, a consistent level of funding for a certain base amount. And that could be like on a quarterly basis, it could be proposed on a monthly basis. Um, and different than that might be like sort of deliverable types of things types of things. So a needs assessment, the program plan, the final plan at the end, those are more like deliverable kinds of things where you might pull in more staff or an outside consultant to help with things. And there it would be more around like a specific payment amount at a certain milestone or deliverable. Similarly in phase two, which is more the implementation section, um, you could have a base programming and event staffing and marketing and outreach staffing that would have quarterly payments towards those staff or monthly payments you could propose, plus additional sort of more deliverable kind of based things that were like roadmaps or studies, curriculum development, adapting resources, specific events, tours, and trainings. Next slide. Um, attachment D is a sample agreement, and I apologize, I think in attachment B, we make reference to attachment C instead of D, but we mean D. Um, this is our standard legal agreement. Anybody who's contracted with us before has seen it a bunch. We just want you to read it over with your legal team to make sure you're comfortable with it, because if there are things that are not okay with your legal agreement, we want your legal team, we want that proposed as part of your application. Uh, so in the, the B narrative, attachment B narrative, there's a checkbox that says that you've read it and you accept it. And if you don't and you want to mark up, you would take this document and mark something up. Next slide. So I think we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, Irene, have you seen any in the chat? I haven't looked. None yet. I had a question. Um, in other RFPs I've applied to, they've created like message boards. So that way potential applicants can find each other and like leverage strengths that different partners might have. Is there any thought around creating some type of space for potential applicants to come together and figure out, you know, who might be a good partner in this work? I think most of the time when we do that, that's like in our empower programs or some other programs. I don't expect this to be a grassroots effort, I guess. I do, we do encourage partnerships for sure, uh, but I don't think we're planning to do that. Thank you. I'm gonna stop share so that we can all see each other. So if we don't have additional questions, uh, I want to remind everyone that you can always submit questions by email, as it says in the RFP. We tend there's a deadline. Irene, do you mind looking that up? What the deadline is for questions? Um, we try and post respond to them and and write written responses that get posted on the website within a few days. Uh, we set a deadline just because it gets hard to uh, do it at the very last minute. So I see a question from Aaron. How do you envision this effort interfacing with other existing initiatives within Mass Save? I lost the rest of it. So I would say that Mass Save, we've been talking to the program administrators at Mass Save about this effort. Um, I would expect close coordination with it. I would expect, I think in the RFP, if you read it, like there's an example of Maybe there were to be an event around uh, elementary and middle schools and high schools that want to decarbonize. We would expect Mass CEC would be one or Mass Save, uh, the new construction program, which sometimes they get bumped into, or the Deep Energy Retrofit Incentive Program, or any other incentives, that they would be one of the speakers on that sort of uh, panel uh, so that it's customized content. So 
the building performance exchange staff should be interfacing with MassDave regularly. And I would say the other function that we see is helping send people to the right places at MassSave. Um, we tend to find people get a little lost depending on which, you know, what they think is an existing building shouldn't be in the new construction program, but that is where the best incentive is for them. We would expect that staff at the building performance exchange would be able to direct them to the correct person at the correct utility, but not necessarily like have a high level characterization of what the incentive might be that would be interesting to them, but not necessarily helping them sign up for it or walk them through it, if that helps. The other initiative that the state is working on right now is the clearinghouse study that was initiated after the Clean Heat Commission. There is a, a recommendation there around creating a clearinghouse that is much more around coordination of all the incent state incentives and mass save incentives for building owners. Uh, it includes the very, you know, the one to four residential home kind of market, as well as these bigger buildings. It's not clear exactly what is going to be recommended or what the state's going to be doing there. But I think mass, C mass CEC sort of sees this $4 million as a uh, no regrets investment. We're going to learn a lot doing this. And if and it's going to take several years for a clearinghouse concept to be for everyone to agree on it and to move forward with it. However, that happens, I think whatever develops through this this building performance exchange will help inform that and can be integrated with that. <laughs> no worries, we understand. I hope that helped. So related to the budgeting, right, you've got the, um, you know, part of the whole, the first step is to create a plan and, or to do an assess needs assessment, then do a plan and create a long-term kind of financial plan. Can you just talk a little bit more about what you're expecting with the budgeting, be, you know, having not done the plan, <laughs> the needs assessment or the plan yet? It's a, it seems a little bit backwards a little bit. <laughs> so the tricky part is, right, I, I wouldn't expect I wanted to have a full plan at application period. And I would expect the bulk of the money to be in that program implementation task. I think you can at least envision how much like staffing versus like events. And like, you can look at that spreadsheet that we had as an example, but I think it's sort of, you're not gonna know exactly which events you're gonna do, but you might know like about how much on events you would want and how much on curriculum development you would want. So, I know that the categories say like milestone deliverable, that's just because that's the way Mass CC tends to budget. But if you can think beyond that about core like base amounts that might be towards regular staffing of uh, answering phone calls and directing people and then putting on events and outreach kind of stuff versus one time kind of things, which would be one event at a time or a roadmap or a tool or like, so it can be a blend, a hybrid is what I'm trying to communicate of those two things. That's helpful. Um, I have a, another question. Irene mentioned the appendix and I didn't see anywhere in the RFP outside of the um, resumes that there was to add anything. So it sounds like you you will accept uh, work samples or other things in the appendix. I just don't know if you want to provide a little bit more guidance on what would be in the, in what could be in that appendix. I will say it does mention on page um, 14, along with the resumes, up to three relevant work samples. So that will be, I think, up to the applicant to decide, to decide what kind of work sample they deem most relevant and want to share with this. But that would be something, like you said, that would be included in the appendix. Okay. And then kind of similarly, just around numbers, you've, only, you've asked for two references. Um, you're not asking for letters from those, just the, just connections to those. And you want no more than two, just two. 
Yeah, and in attachment B, um, there is that is one of the sections where you put in there the contact information for your references. Okay, don't need more than that. And you don't need letters of support, to be clear. And I don't think we would really welcome it. If someone's partnering you with you, I think it should be mentioned in the narrative. That's helpful, thank you. And I will say like partnering can be loose, but I think you should say what kind of partnership it is. So if they are like a subcontractor proposed or a trainer, or like there's funding that's going to them, to me, that's a different level that you wanna point out the difference versus someone who you're gonna coordinate closely with on bringing people in and using their network, that kind of thing. To me, that would go under that organizational capacity like portion. Can we answer any other questions? Oh, I guess I didn't really answer the embodied carbon challenge portion of Aaron's question, which is we do mention embodied carb centralizing embodied carbon content. Uh, existing buildings is a really important piece of reducing embo uh, embodied carbon emissions. So that's part of what we're thinking. Um, I don't know, you know, there's content that has, I honestly, most of it lives with a uh, carbon leadership forum that's more centralized information about the embodied carbon. There, I mean, I think BE Plus will have their embodied carbon website up, but we do want that to be part of the capability and the technical knowledge at the organization as it gets set up, is some understanding of embodied carbon and trying to centralize or point to the resources, even if it's not all housed there. Are the phases meant to track to years? Not necessarily. We are flexible. Yeah, because the, the funding phases A through C, that four million up to four million dollars is over four years. That's that's three phases over the course of four years with the possibility of the phase D um, with the additional two million in funding. But the two million could be like we would expect to know within about a year whether the two million is going to happen or not. So it could be added within a four year period, more spending in the first four years, or it could be to extend the years at a similar level. Any goals on when we want things up and running? Of course, as soon as possible. <laughs> There's realism here too, but I mean, I think. Part of the reason that the scoring is very heavily on experience and especially experience with the Massachusetts building professionals community is we do not wanna create something from new. We very much hope we can piggyback on an ex existing organizations or groups that already are there and have great interactions with architects, engineers, contractors, energy consultants already. Um, and building owners. So the more that we can do that, and that's why the scoring is that way, the faster we can do this.
Yeah, planning should not take three of the four years. And I think we have some flexibility depending on how long our process takes on a ramp up period before, you know, like four, it doesn't have to be four exact years. There might be a ramp up period to four active years. When do you expect, to, would you expect contracting to be completed and the work to really kick off? So what, you know, assuming everything goes on our idealistic timeline um, and the process goes smoothly, we're looking at a contract signing and program launch by mid-September. And Catherine, do you want to go through when, I mean, the deadline we already mentioned at the very beginning, do you want to mention any other time periods between then and contracting for general expectations? Um, yeah, just with the caveat that these are not set in stone and, and may be changed. Um, but what we're looking at is um, having, uh, inviting the top applicants in for interviews by the end of July, I think would be sort of the big one for you all to be aware of in, in terms of timing um, and starting to get the contract negotiations underway uh, beginning to mid-August. Well, we are recording this. This should be up in a, several days, I think, if you wanna rewatch any parts of it. Uh, we also have been taking notes on the questions and we will be writing up the responses in the Q&A section of the RFP page. And if any of you submit questions to, I'm pretty sure it's buildings at massdec.com, uh, you can, Anytime, send a question there. We will try and get the answer posted within a few days up on that website. Thank you for joining. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.